everyone, my name is Lisa Ziegler Allen and I am a scientist at J. Craig Venture Institute as well as Scripps Institution of Oceanography, which we are in the backyard of. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I do, which is to study the smallest, typically, biological entities, because they are not living forms on Earth, and those are viruses, which you are all very well versed in right now due to coronavirus. However, the viruses that I study do not infect you and I, but they infect single-celled organisms in the ocean. And why is that important? Well, single-celled organisms in the ocean, like algae or other uh, photosynthetic organisms, those that harness the sun's energy, uh, produce most of the oxygen that we breathe on Earth, which is pretty incredible, right? So we think of trees and not those that are in the ocean. And so I study viruses that infect them. A branch of science, that we call it, is called food webs that we study, right? So you guys have all heard of food chains, where at the bottom of the food chain is usually a plant, something bigger eats the plant, and something bigger than that eats that. But really what occurs is it's this mesh of um, like a food web, like a web, a spider's web, of all these different organisms coming together and interacting with one another. And that interaction and the study of that interaction is also has another term called ecology. And so that's what I study. I study viral ecology. I study how viruses fit into these larger food webs that we talk about. So, and the food web that I would study is from fish on down. I don't really look at fish. That would be what we look at is from fish down to viruses and how they impact the environment. Why is this all important is that many times when viruses are in a system, which they're in every system, they're in your body and they're not necessarily bad. They're on the sand, they're in the ocean, they're everywhere a living organism exists much of what they do is also help to turn over nutrients, right? So you think of food or nutrients that all life needs. So things like carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus, and they're really good when they're interacting with one another. Their interaction usually causes this turnover. And so while we think of it as negative because it's an infection, you can flip it on its head and then talk about turnover of nutrients. So without them, there would be no turnover and there would be no ability for organisms to adapt and move and change. And so that is a very important factor in life. <laughs> They're the yin and the yang. Yes. yes. <laughs> it is like kind of, yeah, it's what you want to look at and how you look at it. Because uh, they are still killing that cell to release those nutrients. That is what's happening. However, when you have, when you're talking about single-celled organisms and populations, that's a whole nother, all kinds of terms and theories for this, but one may help the others. And this happens a lot, especially with bacteria and single-celled algae, is one might help the whole population or the whole community by taking that virus, releasing their nutrients, turning over. The really interesting thing that I love and that we're getting more and more into is the study of these food webs next to each other. So you can go out in the ocean and let's say I go right here off this rock, and then I go right there off the pier. That's how close they are. They can be completely different food webs, more or less. You can have it in that close range, and it's due to the filaments and the way the water is moving and what organisms are kind of riding on that filament. And so that's what we also study, is how uh, communities, so now we're moving from just talking about one organism into all the organisms that are present in a sample, we call it a community. So what we study is those communities which make up that food web and how one might exist right here and how different that is to the community next door. It's in a different filament of water. And that's the beauty of the ocean because it's not stagnant. It's not like this piece of sand right here where there's that rock and then there's this rock that you can go to. It's constantly moving. So while that might be, uh, I don't know, many people might think of a detriment, right? Because you can never go back to the same water mass twice almost, right? You can put something out there and you can take a sample and take a sample, but once you take that one sample, there's new water right next to you the next second. So that's what you have to think about. And that's what's incredible to me. And so that's what we try to piece back together is who is this food web? Who is that food web? And what do they do to the system as a whole? And how do they interact with one another? Or do they interact with one another? Maybe they don't interact with one another. That's okay too. And so that's what we've been looking at. And what we find is that set up entirely different food webs based on those interactions, that ecology, which is not only the interactions among the populations themselves,
ourselves among the community, but it's also not even just biology. It's also the chemistry that's there. So it like gets bigger and bigger. And so that ecology is what, what we like to look at. Nice. It's back together. I get to study both the surface ocean and then we're looking at things that photosynthesize, right? So those are the organisms like algae, like some of the seaweed that you see here that take in the sun's energy and they convert that and they're the base, they're the primary producers, right, of that food chain. But what we also get to study out in uh, typically the middle of the ocean, it feels like, not near shore, where we have all these nice photosynthesizers and algae, we study the bottom of the ocean. And so then we get to go out on pretty awesome ships. We get to use robots sometimes, or submarines, to go down to the bottom of the ocean. What we study there is the primary producers, but there there's no sunlight, right? So what do they do? They take in chemistry, often that's percolating out of the crust of the ocean, and they convert that, and those are the primary producers. So what I love about what I get to do is that I get to study viruses in two different energy regimes, I like to call it, right? So we have the surface, which is all these photosynthesis photosynthesizers, it's a mouthful, um, and then the bottom, which are chemolithoautotrophs, right? So <laughs> My new favorite word! Hold on, hold on, hold on. Electrific Auto, wait, say it again. Chemolithoautotrophs. Chemolithic. Wait, say it again. Chemolith. <laughs> now I can say it. Chemolith. The autotrophs. Now I can say it. <laughs> Chemolithic autotrophs. Yes. Okay, that say works. it again one more time. Chemolithoautotrophs. Chemolithoautotrophs. I mean, we study the viruses that infect those primary producers in that environment as well at the bottom of the ocean. Um, so it's, it's nice to piece that together. And they're very different communities, but yet some of those basic interactions, that basic ecology, how they're sort of, uh, turning over those nutrients and how they're interacting are the same, which I think is pretty fabulous. One of the aspects that I mentioned was getting out on a boat, and that is something that I love. I have not gotten to do it, obviously, during the pandemic. We were keeping safe, we were keeping distance. However, it is the best part, I think, of my work is that I get to do what's called field work. As an oceanographer, that field work includes going out to sea and really getting in there and studying the organisms where they exist. Not bringing them back to the lab necessarily, right? So that is super fun. And what that means is that I also get to work with really smart people like engineers that help me make samplers so that I can sample the smallest. Remember, let's all remember, right, that I say the smallest biological entities. So with that comes all kinds of craziness on how you how you detect them, how you sample them, how you think about what you're doing. It's not the same as studying the living organism. They're quite different um, in terms of how you sample them. So I get the fun job of interacting with engineers that help me learn how to create something better so that I can see them, see them in their habitat. So I've been on actually a lot of different ships. Uh, so one of them, Fun, right, is the Falcor with Schmidt Ocean Institute, and that was uh, working on deep sea biology. So, again, going down. And so, in this case, one thing that I didn't mention is that what we call them are hydrothermal vents. So, these are areas where a lot of times when you go down, which I have been down in a submarine, it's amazing. I was on the Alvin, which was on the Atlantis, RV Atlantis, which is a different ship. However, so when you go down there, it's almost like being on Mars. It just looks dark. Uh, there's usually a lot of really like gray, black rock. Every once in a while you'll see usually a weird fish, which Ben Frable would be able to identify, which I can't. Uh, <laughs> maybe an octopus, some other things. And then all of a sudden you come around the corner and where there's underwater volcanoes, right? So for all that chemistry is percolating up, you see life, just lots of it. So worms and shrimp and crabs, and all of a sudden you go from something that looks desolate, like the surface of Mars, the surface of the moon, and then you come around a corner and it's just teeming with life. And so that, those are the areas that we study. Those are the areas with all of that life, all of that bacteria that we can't see, the microscopic organisms, that's what we study there. It's really hard to taxonomically classify, right? You guys might have heard about you know, how organisms get their genus and species name, right? We're homo sapiens, every entity, biological entity, I have to say, because I study viruses. Um, has a scientific name. And that process is called classification and we call that a taxonomy. So you can go to the highest level all the way down to that genus and species or the two lowest levels. 
taxonomy. Viruses are actually very difficult because morphologically they might look similar, but genetically and how they behave, very different. So it becomes kind of this squash. But so I have a group, I like to say, that I like, and those are the Portoviralis. These, these are single-stranded RNA viruses, similar to what is infecting everybody right now, but they also are this very, very, very small viruses. They infect the algae that I like to study, diatoms, which you'll hear a lot about by other people um, that study diatoms. And so I study the viruses that infect them. They are incredibly tiny and we still do not know all of what they do. Their genomes are usually, um, have not that many genes, maybe like six to 10 genes. 10 would be a lot. So they have very, very tiny genomes, yet they can completely take down an entire population of organisms. And we don't know really how they do that. And so to me, that becomes a really interesting biological phenomenon, right? Because they're not infecting all the time, but when they do, they can have these mass effects. And then the other thing that we think that they're doing is that they're just hanging out. So they're not infecting, they're not causing death all the time, right? Because that, that's something that's uh, very peculiar about viruses is they basically live as parasites, right? And so they can't take down all of their hosts. Otherwise, what would they do? Because they don't live. They can't replicate. They cannot create their own what we call progeny without a host. And so they can't just take everybody out, right? Yeah. So it's very interesting that cycle that exists between them and how they adapt and how the host adapts. And when you have these really tiny viruses, to me, that becomes uh, fun to look at because we don't really know what they're doing. How are they doing it? How are they interacting inside the cell? So I talked about big interactions, right? How they turn over nutrients and talking about food webs. But what we also study is inside the cells, single cells. We like to look inside one cell and see what's happening and then piece that all back together. So we do a lot of really, um, use a lot of really cool tiny technology microfluidics we call it, to get one cell at a time and then we sequence everything in there so that we can see the virus and we can see what the host is doing at that time. And then we sequence thousands of them at once and then build that puzzle back together. A lot of what I do I feel like is building puzzles and piecing it all back together. So either from the large web down to the single cell. And they're going against really super powered things and taking it down just by being simple, by not being complicated. Yeah, that's what I love about these viruses that's why they're my favorite one we don't really know what they do but two they're to me they're the most efficient you can't call them living but the most efficient entity right because they know exactly what they're doing they know how to do it and then that's it so this is why we went from so i used to do these big environmental studies right go out on ships and i still do it and i love it but what what we kept finding was that we really didn't understand what we were looking at because there's so much diversity in viral populations and viral out there and one of those reasons is that even within a cell so now we've gone all the way down to one infection within a cell the diversity the genetic diversity among the viral populations in that cell is still huge because they're sampling even at that single infection within a single cell so you can have all these different genomes that are different this genetic diversity that's different within one cell of one infection and then if you blow that up into the population you blow that up again into the next infection it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and so that that adaptation and that that ability to sample their own genetic diversity to me is amazing and phenomenal and, and I don't and I don't know how they do it and I think that is what keeps me so curious about them so long as there uh, is a typical life cycle of like a virus so that because that helps you because their life cycle helps right if it's a short life cycle you could you could look at many generations really fast right right and so that is one beauty of studying so i study uh viruses that infect diatoms which are single cell eukaryotic right so we're eukaryotic we're eukary eukaryotes <laughs> uh, and so these are single cell eukaryotes so to me and the viruses are very similar like coronavirus or other viruses that infect us. There, there's viruses within the coronaviruses that do infect us, right? So there are some biological similarities or parallelism there, even though they, the ones I study do not infect us. But so, so to me, that's a really important um, aspect that we can kind of harness in the lab and we can look at that diversity in real time because diatoms grow, you know, every like 18 hours will divide, right? So then if you think about an infection, it's usually the infections that we study are less than a week long. 
so that we can actually get in there and study them. Um, oh, that's the life cycle of the virus then, right? Yeah, yeah. So you can think about that as they don't live. Life. Wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Your undead cycle. I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's not alive because it doesn't exist by itself. It can't divide on its own. It has. It, it solely exists. If you think of it like a parasite, it has to be within a cell. Most virus. There are giant viruses. Oh, we're killing the cell, not the virus. No, no, you are. You, you can dismantle them. You can make the virus. With, but then you're using different words, right? This is where it all gets to semantics and all that. But so you're making it non-infectious. So sometimes you're taking a rat. So viruses can be naked. Yeah. And they don't have an envelope or they can have an envelope. And so coronavirus has an envelope. And so that's why it's so important to wash our hands right now. Because for that one particularly, that envelope is... Uh, <laughs> and so that soap, right, like versus like. And so that soap kind of washes it off and helps to dismantle and take out that envelope. And without that envelope, it can infect. So it's no longer infectious. So that's what you want to do. So naked viruses, sometimes we think of them as being a little bit more hardy and they can exist for longer. So norovirus, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of that. It can give you really nasty tummy aches. Uh, it happens a lot on cruise ships. Any water that gets infected with norovirus or if it, if it is on a surface, right, it can exist longer in part because it doesn't have that envelope that we can wash off very easily. Dr. Ziegler Allen questions live Zoom on May 1st from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. We're going to post the exact 15 minutes that you could be there. Uh, looking forward to seeing you. I know you guys are as curious as me, right? Yes. Come ask me questions. Nice. All right. Stay curious and keep on sciencing. That's what's up.